Good evening. Welcome. Uh, I'm really excited about this event tonight. This is a culmination of our annual lecture series, this year's theme on the power of science fiction. And it's also the first keynote address in our uh, annual conference on values in medicine, science, and technology. Um, and I can think of no better person to talk about the intersection of those two sets of things than our speaker tonight, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson uh, is a hard person to introduce because he's, he's uh, so accomplished. He's won the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, the Campbell Award. Um, he has written science fiction novels in a variety of subgenres. Um, uh, many that you, I'm sure, have heard of, the Mars Trilogy, the Three Californias Trilogy, um, my favorite, the Science in the Capital Trilogy, recently republished and condensed as a single novel called Green Earth, um, which is absolutely lovely, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, will be for sale in the lobby after the lecture, um, so you can pick that up uh, and get it signed by the author. Um, uh, also, recently, um, a book, in a way, a kind of successor to the Science in the Capital trilogy, which is sort of about the very near future of what climate change might do. Um, his, his new book, New York 2140, a little bit further in the future, uh, the world after, after climate change in some, in some ways, um, uh, just has just recently come out. Um, Stan Robinson has a PhD in literature from the University of California, San Diego. Um, my alma mater, uh, so I'm very proud to share that with Stan. Um, uh, Stan did his PhD on the works of Philip K. Dick. Um, I first met Stan at UC San Diego when I was a graduate student. Um, he came and did a kind of uh, discussion event with Frederick Jameson, um, the, the, the famous Marxist literary theorist with whom he studied as a graduate student. Um, Jameson was talking about his new work, kind of critical theory of, um, of post-capitalism and science fiction. Stan was reading, uh, doing a reading of his book, uh, one of the Science of the Capital books that had just come out, very powerful uh, reading uh, where uh, a fervent um, believer in, in science was uh, uh, really, really giving it to government uh, agency heads who were making, weren't making fast enough progress. Uh, just, just the, uh, it really was striking to me. Um, and what struck me about it in a way is that Stan's work kind of, kind of combined the nuanced sort of interrogation of the relationship uh, between science um, and, and humanity and society uh, that I was used to from some of the best science fiction writers with a, with a sensibility of, of sort of philosophical and critical um, uh, understanding that uh, really spoke to me as a, as a, as a budding philosopher of science. Um, and really uh, uh, had an influence on my thinking going on into my work, uh, becoming uh, an academic, a professor of philosophy, uh, the director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology. Um, and we had Stan uh, come several years ago to talk about uh, climate change and the kind of possible futures uh, uh, um, that we might envision. Uh, and planning this series on the power of science fiction, I really wanted to bring Stan back to help us think about the meaning of science fiction, the power of science fiction in our, in our thinking about our society and our relationship to, to science and technology. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to have him with us here tonight. I think you're in for a treat in his lecture. So please join me in welcoming Stan Robinson to the stage. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Matt, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for having me uh, back. Um, um, uh, our Dean Dennis and uh, Sabrina and Magda and uh, my friend, the great poet uh, Fred uh, Turner. It's really it's a, a pleasure to be back and see see you all again. And so, 
Um, tonight I'm going to talk for um, about 50 minutes and then take questions and answers about um, uh, the topic of science fiction is the realism of our time, which really I have to admit is a kind of a, a, a throwaway line that I often make in the context of other talks and, and it's part of another line that I say that um, we're all living in a science fiction novel that we are co-writing together. and. Um, but this time, it's an opportunity to go into a little bit more detail that, about what I mean when I say that and, and try to unpack this, this, um, these phrases a little bit more. And that's a pleasure because I get to talk about my, my, my craft and what I do. Um, and then also, I mean, to do that, I have to talk about what I think science fiction is and what I think realism is. And so I get to get into literature. And then also how we use these things. Um, uh, literature in general to to uh, help us to understand and get oriented to the world. So that's my my plan here. So first, realism. It's always in contrast to something else. So it's a binary or it's part of a larger system of terminologies. And there's a couple I'll discuss. Um, uh, one briefly, realism as opposed to non-realism. And there's many names for this non-realism, but I like the one that John Clute uses in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and the Encyclopedia of, of Fantasy, where he calls it fantastica, using the, the Polish spelling. So science fiction, fantasy, horror, surrealism, anything that isn't realism, he, he says we could call fantastica and dispense with the the, the fine distinctions that can't really be made between all of the various fantasticas. Um, so you have the domestic realist novel as kind of the benchmark figure that in the English tradition, which we're, most of us are most familiar with, you get it invented maybe by a Defoe, and it goes Defoe and then Fielding and Richardson and then uh, the 19th century greats, Jane Austen in particular, but also uh, Dickens and Eliot, George Eliot, the, maybe the greatest uh, realist novelist ever. But what you can see when Dickens gets included there is that this notion that literature could be about ordinary people doing things that ordinary people did. It was no longer about gods and ghosts, but more about ordinary life and the drama of getting by in this modernizing world of the early modern period that um, you're repressing an awful lot as a storyteller when storytelling began with uh, Fantastica and with Gilgamesh and went on from there. And so whenever you repress, you get the return of the repressed. So when you ha include Charles Dickens as a realist, you realize how weird realism can get. Um, not only his characters are extravagant, but his plots are bundles of coincidences. And um, nobody minds, and people think of him as being realistic. And maybe, uh, maybe London in Dickens' time was just like that. So um, this is already a, an indication of what's going on with realism as a, a limiting factor that is still um, you know, tries to be about contemporary life in, in things that really happen. And there's even... Uh, like when the return of the repressed comes bulging up with someone like Dickens, then there will be a form of realism that was even more realistic, which we call naturalism. And naturalism has never really been properly included in the literary canon. It kind of comes and goes. In England, someone like Gissing. In France, someone like Zola. In America, Dreiser or Sinclair Lewis, maybe. But Dreiser is the classic naturalist. And these writers were insisting that you had to stick to just the real stuff that really happened. So it was pretty grim. It was um, 19th century industrial life and horrible things kept happening to poor people everywhere. And there's a certain um, ominous quality to naturalism and also a little bit of tedium as daily life because the fiction has never been good at dealing with work life. And so many people, um, work life is, takes up the bulk of their waking hours, and yet the novel in particular is not great at dealing with work life. So in the 19th century, when they were working so hard on realism, where that was seen to be the project for the novel in particular, then you get poetry and you have romanticism. So if realism is kind of like the Enlightenment in the 18th century, 
Then the 19th century comes along and says, but wait, ghosts are as real as anything else. And my dreams are more real than my daily life. And you get the romantics and you get poetry and you get things like Tennyson going back to the Arthurian legend or Browning's uh, To the Dark Tower Came. Uh, Fantastica was alive and well in the 19th century. And then uh, prose writers would do it too. George MacDonald, Lord Dunsany, and they would somewhat get categorized as children's literature because it was Fantastica. And slowly but surely, you got into the 20th century and there was a hierarchy built up where realism was good and Fantastica was obviously lame, um, crazy, um, lowbrow children's literature. Um, and this was a, a dichotomy that was um, enforced by American English departments, especially in the post-war period, where you, the, the most intense uh, pressure was brought to bear on highbrow and lowbrow so that you had um, a realism as being highbrow and good, and um, Fantastica being part of the lowbrow culture of comic books and whatever else was going on down there in the world of the hoi polloi. And it was a very much of a caste system, very snobbish. Uh, Proust has this analyzed to a T, that the desire for superiority that it comes out of insecurity and snobbery is always a, a sign of weakness. And, Realism at that point was caught in a kind of an academic trap that goes on in the 20th century into the um, USA MFA creative writing programs and also into the New York literary establishment of the New York Times, the New Yorker, the New York Review of Books, dreadful um, cultural arbiters that also set up the awards that are club awards. And Fantastica would never be uh, included in this because that's lowbrow stuff. Well. Let's shift over to the other pattern where it goes realism, modernism, and postmodernism. And this is somewhat my old teacher, Fred Jameson's um, format of his way of talking about it, was that realism was about the 19th century and the construction of our modern world. And then, um, and he, he, he uh, as a Marxist, he loved this base superstructure format where the changes were involved with Ernest Mandel's visions of capitalism, being first steam-powered and coal-powered, and then being uh, electrically powered uh, by, um, I forget the Mandel industrial changes, maybe nuclear-powered or information, but you had uh, realism, modernism, postmodernism happening, um, and what Fred would say at that point was that um, in, in the realist period, you were modernizing and, and everything was, uh, Balzac was the great uh, realist of that um, period. Then modernism comes along when there's still an older world that can be remembered. So modernism, you're halfway modernized. And so modernity is only halfway there. You could have a life or a childhood in the countryside, especially in France, and then come to the city you could see them both, and so the intense um, focus on time and on memory that you see in the great modernist writers is a function of, of uh, people having a foot in two different worlds, the uh, sort of past and future. And that the postmodernist moment, which according to the Mandel scheme is like 1973 with the oil crash and the end of American hegemony is the moment when we're in a fully modern world, and no matter where you're going to go on the globe, you're going to be seeing a, a Pink Floyd t-shirt on the local salesperson, and that's when postmodernism comes into play. Well, um, Giovanni Arrighi has a better scheme than Mandel's for the structure and the period. period this is a periodizing exercise we're in right now. Of, um, of how capital moved first from Genoa, where with uh, you know double ledger bookkeeping and foreign expansion, you get the beginnings of capitalism, and then Holland takes over at another um, expansion, then Britain, the British Empire, and then the American Empire. And at each one of these stages, there's a period of accumulation, and then there's a period of, of uh, over accumulation and surplus, and then you get financialization, and then you get the next bigger power to come along and take over. So this has sort of superseded um, the Mandel plan, and it doesn't fit as well with realism, modernism, 
uh, postmodernism, but that doesn't really matter because these are modeling exercises. Anytime you're doing periods, you're, you're making artificial distinctions in the flow of history to try to clarify what happened to yourself. And most recently, we've got Jason Moore's uh, Capitalism in the Web of Life, where it, the, essentially a kind of combination of greens and reds in that environmentalism and a standard Marxist leftism are finally brought together into one scheme that makes sense of both while still staying on the side of the people and the planet. So this is an important thing where he talks a lot about every time capitalism has expanded, it's gone into a new zone, a new life zone, new countries, new continents, new populations that have been appropriated and then turned into part of the uh, capitalist machinery of profit, and that that has led to what he calls the four cheaps. Um, cheap. I don't. I, this is uh, to tell you the truth. I'm not sure I can remember what the four cheaps are, but cheap labor, cheap food, cheap energy, and cheap resources. And that we may be at the end of the four cheaps, and that this is one of the things that's going on. So um, they talked about it as postmodernism for a while, from say the late 70s until just recently, but now I think we're calling this the Anthropocene. We're in the area, in the era where humanity is um, affecting the planet more than any natural process, and it's a fully, um, a, a, an attempt to fully capture the natural world for human and capitalist purposes. Uh, and so this, this shifts, to a large extent, the old pattern of Ernest Mandel and even of Jameson's, because you're including the planet in the story in a way that it wasn't included, uh, except tangentially, in a classical Marxism. And, and this is good, because including the planet in the story means that science fiction comes to the fore, because that's one of the things, amongst others, that science fiction does. Uh, and that's another reason why I would call it the realism of our time, because science fiction naturally and inevitably includes the planet in a way that, especially modernism, with this high lit, this um, literary fiction, this MFA fiction that has dominated the cultural notion of what good fiction is for the last mm, 50, 60 years or so, they never did, and it never does now. The, the novel in its uh, 19th century high point was the relationship between the individual and other individuals, of course, and then the individuals and society, and then individuals and history, so that you had in the 19th century novels of Balzac and Tolstoy, the classics, um, uh, a relationship between the human individual and history itself that goes away in modernism, where it's a much more private, subjective, experience of stream of consciousness of an individual where at most you get an indirect play off of the society but you never really think about the world as a planet or about history as a whole and um, that was regarded as the only thing that uh, really mattered in literature for a while but now I think it's clear that in these terms science fiction is uh, going back to a bigger tradition of the novel and is more realistic so it isn't, it may be, since realism is the name for a certain period in, in literary and, and the history of the novel, it isn't that science fiction is the realism of our time. I put it wrong all these years. It's that science fiction is more realistic than any other uh, literature, and I hope I've made that clear. Now, so let's talk about science fiction for a while here. Um, I've been using the image recently of science fiction as a kind of stereo opticon, which is an antique device. Uh, 3D glasses at the movies is probably better, where you have two lenses. And science fiction is always doing two things at once. And uh, that's one of the reasons why some people love it and some people are thrown off by it and can never get into it, is you have to be able to um, make the two images that are coming at you from science fiction cohere into a single image like 3D glasses. So on the one hand, science fiction is stories set in the future. It's as simple as that. You put it, you set a story in the day after tomorrow, it's science fiction. If you set it five million years from now, it's science fiction, even though those are two very different story spaces. And um, therefore, science fiction is related to prophecy. Very, very ancient power. A lot of the books of the Old Testament are saying, look, this is what's coming because of the way you people are. 
It's a little admonitory and a little bit of a Thoreauvian scolding of one's fellow citizens for not being good enough. Uh, and this pro power of prophecy, which is so ancient, is not to be denied. And like some of my fellow science fiction writers will say, oh, science fiction is not really about the future. Why would you say that? It's a, it's a great, powerful thing to have. Saying science fiction is about the future. It's a serious attempt to portray a possible future and one that could happen, given what we know right now. Uh, you even run out a timeline often. Um, and it's not that this will happen. It's not prediction, because the future cannot be predicted. It's too multivariant and too unpredictable. But it could happen this way. And so you're like running a scenario or a modeling exercise saying, from where we are right now, all we have to do is postulate this kind of thing happening, and we'll get to this other point that I'm now describing to you with thick texture. You get to live there for a while, and that's important. It makes it more than futurism, and it's definitely not prediction. So um, the second lens is, indeed, science fiction is about right now. It is a metaphor for right now. It's always, nobody can ever talk about anything but their own time. And when you look at older science fictions, you see that very clearly. It's hilarious. They didn't get it right. It's nothing like what really came to pass. But if you want to know what 1954 felt like when you were in 1954, you need to read the science fiction of 1954 to get that, if, if this is what they felt was in potential in their own time. So um, these metaphors are obvious. Uh, the, the original robots from uh, Carl uh, Kapech in, in, in uh, Czechoslovakia were obviously the working class. Uh, the work was robotic, the robots might rebel and kill you all. This was a kind of bourgeois image of the working class. That was the robots. Spaceships are images of cities. Um, artificial intelligence is obviously an image for science itself, which is my own reading of this, but I'm pretty convinced that that's the case. Zombies, that's the precariat. That's the middle class with your health insurance and your pension gone forever and your job security. We're all zombies. And that's the fascination of zombies. Vampires, very obviously, sucking our blood, the working class. And I know that these particular metaphors must be true because you never see the obvious TV mega hit, vampires versus zombies. How could that be? This is the most obvious story in the world, vampires versus zombies. You could write it in your sleep, falling off a log. It's too scary of a story to tell. It's too true. It's too dangerous. So it doesn't happen. It never gets green-lighted. So um, these are symbols, as in poetry. That's what science fiction does. It's a kind of prose poetry in, through that lens, saying that the world feels like this, like we're all robots or zombies. And that's one of the things that science fiction is doing. Now, the two lenses do not always match up very well. Um, uh, I've, many a time, I have, through one lens, been talking about the year in my book, uh, New York 2140, um, in one lens, I'm talking about what New York might really be like in the year 2140. In the other lens, I want to talk about what happened in the financial crash of 2008. They don't match up all that well. But a generous reader, a science fiction reader, will make the two images flow together, and then a third dimension pops. And that's history. That's that third dimension is the dimension of time. It's not a spatial dimension, but a temporal dimension. You're seeing the now through one's lens. You're seeing a possible future through the other. And the whole stretch of time from here to there, including all the things that might happen and how we might make it happen, are all um, uh, there in your mental uh, auditorium as you read a science fiction novel. So people who learn to read science fiction, learn to love science fiction, that's one of the pleasures that they're getting out of it. They're making the two images come together by an act of creative willpower. And even if they're, I don't know if you've ever looked at a stereo opticon and not made them come together. Um, some people say to me, uh, many people have said to me, well, I used to read science fiction when I was a kid. But I don't now because serious people don't read that stuff, you know, or I can't make it work for me. I think they're getting a headache because they never can make the two images come together. So um, when the mesh does happen, you've had quite an experience. And what you have is 
uh, that you see that history, we're in it, it's a process, it's already started, it has a trajectory that comes out of the past and is flying past into the future, and trajectory has momentum, it has inertia. There's nothing, um, there's a suggestion that we're on a track towards something, and then, you know, it, it could go that way. That's the feeling that you want a science fiction novel to give you. So, when I say that science fiction is the realism of our time, I do not mean that it is a return to that domestic um, realism that was uh, dominating the novel during the 19th century for very good reasons. Um, although science fiction will often try to match the style or the density of a 19th century novel in order to give more heft, um, um, more of the a sense of the real uh, to the story that they're telling, which is obviously a fantastica. So you want to give a fantastic story a certain density of the real, so you often will use the stylistics of, of 19th century realism when you're writing science fiction. It means, in a way, you look old-fashioned relative to modernism, which is always uh, experimental, stream of consciousness, avant-garde, um, and concerned with consciousness itself, in the interiority. But the lovely thing about postmodernism is, in postmodernism, you can do anything. We ha we've just had a conference today talking about comic books, about graphic novels. You, you can have academic conferences about graffiti. In fact, there's a graffiti artist whose uh, work is being auctioned off this week for $60 million. In postmodernism, there is no high-low split. And, and also, in postmodernism, if I say to you, I want to write a... a a Defoe novel. Well, good luck. I mean, it's hard to write a Defoe novel. He's awfully good. Same with Trollope. But nobody can look down and you say, oh my God, didn't you hear about Henry James? I mean, how, how uh, you must be an engineer from the 1930s, 1930s that has no literary education whatsoever. In fact, all that's gone away. And you look back and you see a writer like Lawrence Stern. Lawrence Stern is the same, is contemporaneous with Defoe, and yet uh, Tristram Shandy could have been written by Thomas Pynchon. And in fact, if, if that book had been published in 1975 with the name Thomas Pynchon on it, it would have been like better than his Mason and Dixon, where he actually tried to do that. But nobody would have blinked an eye. So the, what I'm saying is that in the postmodern period, you have the stylistic freedom to do anything that you want. And the snobs that are still out there are simply scared people on an island where the tide is rising, like to 50 feet above sea level, I'm going to say. So um, science fiction is the most realistic because it's describing the feel of our time. Uh, and feeling and meaning are what literature is out to do. It's not a factual analysis of the situation. It's not trying to predict the future. It's trying to say how this moment feels and what human history means right now. And what we've got right now is a time of massively accelerating technological and sociological change. We have the internet, we have the global village. Everybody on the planet, at least six billion of the seven billion people knows everything that everybody else knows. And so this is a new situation. Um, and we have uh, planetary change as well. Climate change, we call it, but it's bigger than that. And, and, and I was working on this talk um, this last week, and I was thinking examples are coming to hand. Um, in terms of technological change, there was an article a couple of days ago in the paper about uh, taking skin cells, turning them into a sperm cell and an egg cell, and therefore, A, you could have two men or two women or two anybody have a child together, that doesn't matter anymore, but also one person could have uh, a child of themselves, and it wouldn't be a clone, because it's not parthenogenesis, it would be a sperm cell and an egg cell doing sexual reproduction, so it would be your own child, but you would be the only parent, blah, blah, blah. This might be a science fiction. They're always announcing incredible things in um, microbiology that may or may not come true. But it, there it was in the newspaper, and I'm thinking, okay, this is weird, things are changing. And also, on the political front, I mean, I am old enough that Watergate was a big enough event to like dominate an entire decade, more or less, of vigorous um, action. And then, then earlier this week, it was like we were having a Watergate per day. And so I'm thinking, history has indeed accelerated here, and we are in a different moment. So um, I want to say that it's unprecedented 
But what's interesting about the word unprecedented is that human history has always been, at the moment you're at, unprecedented compared to anything that came before. So what I think we can say now is that today is more unprecedented than ever. <laughs> and that's an interesting situation to be in, and that's another way of describing the Anthropocene. And it's going to keep getting more unprecedented. So, uh, it, well, I should say that as if there's just continuous acceleration. This is a common science fiction mistake to make. The logistic curve, the S curve, where we might be in a period of rapid acceleration, it's likely to flatten off at some point. Almost everything does in nature. So it isn't like things are going to keep getting weirder than right now, because that's almost hard to imagine. Um, but it could be strange for a long time before it flattens out. So, this science fiction notion of what could happen, it ranges from dystopia to utopia. And that, uh, from what's interesting to contemplate is that our moment in history, uh, given all of the factors involved on the planet and civilization, it could lead to a mass extinction event. If we pop a couple of barriers in climate change problems and habitat loss, um, we could go down a spiral where we get into a mass extinction event like the KT event or the earlier ones in Earth's history. This would be the sixth one, the only one caused by people. And that mass extinction event could actually mess up the biosphere to an extent that we ourselves would be hammered. I don't think, because there's so many of us, and because we are so ingenious, I don't think we ourselves are in danger of extinction. But if we were to cause a, a mass um, uh, food shortages, a crisis such that half of humanity died, then after the humans that survived that would be post-traumatic and would not be a sane uh, population left after that. And, and it would also imply the loss of most of the other mammals on the planet. I just heard yesterday from a friend that 90%, 90, I think he said 97% of the biomass, biomass on this planet right now, uh, I, I think he must mean vertebrate biomass to tell you the truth, is um, humans and their domestic animals. So we've changed the planet in dangerous ways and we could be headed for a horrible crash. That is indeed possible from this moment. On the other hand, um, we're smart, we've gathered a lot of experience and expertise, the power of science is rather immense, and if we were to get our act together, there is also a completely realistic possibility of us having sustainability and adequacy for all humans, and then sharing it also with all of the rest of the mammals on the planet, and then the, the rest of the plant, uh, plant life, insect life, bird life, a little bit, more resilient to uh, human interference than the other mammals are, just judging by the situation so far. So in, so in other words, a, a functioning utopia, which I would just call an optopia, the best you can do given where we are and what we are, uh, is also possible. A, name, a very positive history is possible from right now. The spread is huge, and then what you don't want to conclude, which is sort of like what one immediately concludes, is that, well, we'll end up muddling our way and it'll be somewhere down the middle. It's a, it's a kind of a Aristotelian excluded middle. If we do things right, it's likely to get really uh, good. If we do things wrong, it's likely to get really bad. There is no functioning middle. We have to do one or the other in the next century or two because it's like we're on an attenuating peninsula which drops off hard on both sides if you want an image for this historical moment. It's not just a fan where every possibility is equally possible. So um, there's an awful lot of dystopias right now. Everybody notices that. And I think it's partly because that's how things feel. And also fears are easier to express than hopes. And they're also way more dramatic, a lot more car crashes, a lot more explosions. Um, as uh, virtue has its own reward, but no sales at the box office. That's, that's Mae West. <laughs> and I think that there's some truth to that, that utopia being about goodness, being about hope, is intrinsically less dramatic, especially in the movie medium. And also, it's a fearful time. But hope is stubborn and persistent, 
it may be smaller, uh, but I feel that even bacteria have hope that it's it's what gets people up in the morning and gets them started through the day. So utopias have never been particularly common, but um, and dystopias are really popular right now because we have climate change already on top of us. So the dark futures are very uh, present to our mind. Also, we're in what people are calling a political crisis of representation and governance. That we're not sure that we're being represented anymore in democracies, and that we're not sure how the world's being governed to be most sensible and get to the best uh, futures. So utopias are really kind of about the invention of that, and it's a dark time, so you don't get very many of them. There have never been very many of them. The teachers out here who teach a class in utopia can pick the same 10 or 12 texts out of the entire history since Plato or since Sir Thomas More. So it's not a common genre, but it's important. I often think of H.G. Wells, who, after his great scientific romances of the 1890s, he started writing utopias in 1905 with a modern utopia. And then he wrote utopias consistently, and indeed, as May West said, no sales at the box office, it's until he died in 1945. And you have to think about those 40 years, 1905 to 1945, as a period of time to be persistently writing utopian fiction. That is a stubborn man. <laughs> so, um, I do want to say that this notion that things could be very bad or very good is an old one in human history, and we've always been living with it. I want to remember, remind you that in the Paleolithic, new humans, a new species on the planet, could have gone extinct, like the other Homo erectus, the, the, the family of primates that were like us, but not quite like us, that went extinct, is a pretty big bush on the evolutionary tree. And the fact that we survived, and there are many moments along the way where we could have not survived. There was a volcanic explosion 75,000 years ago where um, they estimate that the human population went down to about 2,500 individuals, almost all of them probably on the shores of South Africa where there was, even though there was a, a kind of a nuclear winter, except it was a volcanic winter, and everybody died everywhere else, there they had some, the right kind of uh, tubers and the right kind of clams, so that even without any growing plants and a devastated planet, a few people survived and went on, and we rebounded from that. So at every point, there's been dangers, and we have a lot more resources uh, and a lot more knowledge than they did, so it seems like we should be able to get through this. And um, we need to be planning that good future. So uh, the historical trajectory is fairly contingent, and, and maybe there isn't even historical trajectory. Maybe moment to moment, there's not really much inertia in human affairs, and it could change really fast from extinction to utopia. I have a friend uh, in, at NASA who likes numbers, who says that the average lifetime of a species is about 10 million years on this planet. And we're about 100 to 150,000 years old. So if we don't screw up, we presumably have a long future in which we'll get better at things, at living on this planet than we are right now. And that needs to be planned for. This same friend, by the way, reminded me that we all get about three billion heartbeats, you know, if you're lucky. So don't start counting. I, 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 find, I don't recommend that. So that's our present moment. There's a gigantic shadow of the future, as uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley put it, that, over, that, that shadows us at all point, the future. And it's a big and strange future coming in at accelerating speed. So this is a science fiction story. So, imagining a good Anthropocene. This is um, what utopian fiction is now about, and I want to repeat this name, Optopia. Utopia is not an in-state. It's a name for one kind of history. And Optopia is a nice way to put it, because Utopia means either the good place or no place. But Optopia is a Joanna Russ word, meaning as good as we can get given where we are right now. Let's just work on it. So we work on Optopia. To do that, climate change has to be dealt with. And if we hit certain marks in climate, in tem global temperature rise, in ocean acidity, we're probably going to start geoengineering this planet. 
And it'll be on an emergency basis. We won't really know what we're doing, and we might start doing big things to try to reduce the heat. You increase the albedo of the planet by imitating volcanic explosions, and then it's not as hot as it was before. That's proven and could be done relatively cheaply. I think calling it geoengineering is a bad idea, because engineering implies that we know what we're doing and that we're good at it. So it should be geofinessing, or even geobegging. We are begging Gaia, please, we're going to try these things because we have screwed up and we need to get better fast. So we're going to try these things to try to rescue, rescue operations. The, the volcanic um, uh, substitute, sulfur dioxide, in the atmosphere is the most popular plan. Another one, if sea level rise does get underway and begins to uh, inundate our coastlines, that is a major disaster for humanity. And um, another interesting geoengineering might be pumping seawater back up onto the Antarctic ice cap where it would freeze. And it takes about 10% of all the electricity that humanity produces and about a million w uh, wind power turbines to make that operation go. It sounds absurd. It's a science fiction story. We may end up doing it if we're desperate enough. We may pay those costs. And so, uh, geoengineering may be not just one big thing that we do once. It may be a matter of um, growing more forests, growing peat beds, drawing down carbon out of the atmosphere and tucking it at the bottom of the ocean bed as frozen carbon dioxide, as dry ice. None of these are good methods. Some of them have secondary repercussions that we can either predict or we can't predict. Nobody likes the idea. Um, nobody's confident that it will work without these secondary effects making things worse somehow. And we've done that enough in the past, um, or we think we have, that there's a common folktale that whatever we do, we're bound to screw it up and make things worse. Well, that's not quite right. Um, say you get rid of infectious diseases by way of public health and by way of medical advances. Suddenly, the population of the planet goes to, from uh, 1 billion to 7 billion you know, in less than 100 years. Well, uh, did, is that a screen up, or is that an unexpected side effect of success? This is the, the way we have to start thinking about our, our attempt to uh, uh, make a, a civilization on this planet that uh, gets along with it and allows the planet to provide all the natural resources that keep us alive. Um, we'll decarbonize faster when only when things get desperate, but on the other hand, uh, in this crisis of representation and governance, we have a rather remarkable thing, which is the UN out of World War II and the Paris Accords just a couple of years ago. These are remarkable achievements in cooperation. Let me briefly talk about this crisis of representation and governance, because if we are going to do this great thing and make a civilization that gets along, it's got to be a global achievement. Everybody has to have bought into it. There can't be some people doing the right thing and other people doing the wrong thing. It won't work. And that's a scary thought, because nobody ever agrees on anything. But in the United States, we have two parties. It's a two-party system. They're much alike. They were too much alike. You, you could even say Freud's narcissism of small differences, you know, that you hate most the person that's like you except for one thing that you then fight over because it's a narcissism. But in this case, I'm thinking also it's more than that. It's maybe a narcissism of big differences, that there are some big fundamental differences that we fight over here, and it's easy to play team ball. It's the Dodgers versus the Giants. It's the, you know, the, the Cubbies versus St. Louis, whatever, the team sport that you pick your tribe and it doesn't even matter if your tribe has players that you hate, you're, it's your tribe, it's your team. And so in a two-party system, that is all too common because in the Paleolithic, your tribe was really important. In China, they've got the, the Communist Party, one-party state. It's 80 million people in a population of 1.4 billion. And you can say, well, those 80, billion pe those 80 million people who have uh, worked hard to join the Communist Party are doing their best to guide China in the best possible way, and there are little local elections, and it doesn't look like our democracy. It's a different form of governance. Uh, representation, it's hard to say, because nobody understands China, including the Chinese. In Europe, there's about 20 parties, effectively, across the country in these parliamentary systems where you get representation if you get like two or three percent of the vote. 
And, but it's a two-tier system. It's the nation-state system, and then it's the uh, European Union system. And so again, with representation, nobody can be confident that they're very well represented. If you're an ordinary Greek citizen, you probably think that you aren't. And then it's a three-tier system in Europe and a two-tier system in China and in the United States. And of course, I'm leaving out a lot of other countries here, but just for example, because really global finance and capitalism itself runs the world and, and tells the nation states what to do. Um, and it's the market. So the market is also governance. And uh, strangely, um, you can't really pick the people that are running global capitalism. Um, you could maybe gather up everybody that goes to the Davos conference in the winter and say, okay, that's them. But in, it's way bigger than that. And it's also an international system of laws and treaties. And all the nation states are, they don't have control of their own currencies. They don't have control of currency flights. They don't have control of, uh, essentially, of capital itself. And it's become an international system of its own that tells the nation states what to do. At least this is part of the fight of our time. So it is indeed a crisis of representation. It is indeed a crisis of governance. And I would say about this biggest system, the capitalist system that runs the world now, or, or by which we allow ourselves to set the rules that we all agree to live by, and let's just say maybe this is seven billion people in a kind of semi-functioning democracy of all seven billion of us. We've agreed to this without ever really agreeing to it. Capitalism misprices everything. Everything is a little too cheap. It underprices labor, it underprices um, the environment. And so we, we uh, buyers and sellers are in a kind of an unspoken conspiracy to underpay for things. And that way we get cheap goods and uh, companies get profits both. And it's the future generations that pay the costs that we haven't paid. And some of those are unpayable costs. Some of those are destruction that can't be come back from. So uh, it's, it's a, this is a, a dangerous situation because it isn't clear that there's any better system that anybody's invented yet. And also it rules the world right now and it gets utopian in the bad sense to say, well, the, world, the way the world runs right now is bad, therefore we need to complete change. But wait, we're in today. There are these laws, there are these governments, there are these armies. So what you need is a, a long-term vision, but also a short-term plan. What do I do today? What do I do tomorrow? And, and, and so you need to fight for good governance worldwide and sort of geoengineer the political economic system since climate change and the crisis of representation are two parts of the same problem. And I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. So we have uh, two microphones here, if you'll line up behind the microphones, and I'll just, uh, we'll switch back and forth uh, between you. So we've got somebody here. Go ahead. Thank you very much. It's on. Is it on? Yep. yep. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you, uh, do you feel that oh, that's me. Sorry. finance, the system will repair itself before the people try to repair it with the concept of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and other uh, digital value that can be peer-to-peer. -peer. Thank you for that. And I want to admit immediately that I do not understand Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and, but, but when I try to understand it, it leads me to the following realization. I don't understand money. And that, because it gets the questions of value um, that are very fundamental to our, our social life together, uh, matters of, of trust. And when you get economists talking about trust, you know that there's a terrible thing happened. Because usually when, when t economists are talking about fundamentals, they're talking about price of gold, you know, in, uh, exchange rates. And then when things get tough, the fundamentals that are talking about are trust and ultimate sources of value. We're maybe in that moment now. Now, I do think it would be nice if there were alternative currencies. It seems to me that there was a time when that was true and that it allowed for more uh, 
Liquidity is the wrong word. It allowed for more flexibility in dealing with what we're in. And that's about all I can say, because I am, I'm an English major, and that one leaves me uh, f you know, confused. We'll go back and forth. I stand in your uh, work, Blue Mars, and in 2312, you allude to the Mondragon uh, economic system. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe uh, let us know some of the realities of this and what we could learn from it. Yes, thank you. Mondragon, Spain is a town in the Basque region, up there in the north uh, east of Spain, near the French border. And a, a, a Catholic priest was sent there by Franco in the 1940s to try to calm down these um, uh, nasty Basque people who were unhappy with the Franco regime. He went up there and spent 15 years talking to people and he said, you already have an industrial base here. They were making bicycle parts for France or something like that. He said, let's make this town different. And he convinced the whole town to buy into it. The employees own the companies there. It's a set of nested co-ops that include the financing system of a, of a essentially, I guess you'd call it a credit union. And they're all owned by the employees who hire their management on five-year contracts. And after five years, either fire that manager and hire another one or not. The profits that they make with their businesses in the ordinary capitalist economy, and that's about $2 billion a year right now, are split between um, the employees themselves, shared out, uh, reinvestment in the companies, split three ways, and the third to charities that the employees choose themselves. And they're all paid a, a living wage. It's the profits that the employees are dividing up or getting shares of afterwards. This works for about 100,000 people at about $2 billion a year. And there are economists who say, well, that won't scale. And again, this is like people talking about Piketty in the Wall Street Journal. Why won't it scale? Why wouldn't that work for everybody? So when I'm, as a science fiction writer, trying to look at what's going to post-capitalism going to look like, well, I, that's one of the few examples already existing in the world today that looks to me admirable. And it started as a kind of liberation theology, to tell you the truth, this um, father whose name I'm not remembering. So uh, I urge you to Google Mondragon and think about what it means, especially you know, young people who could, you could join a co-op or you could join an ordinary firm. And if you manage to get into a co-op, your life will be a total hassle. The meetings, the, you know, the, the micropolitics, the, what I call the nanopolitics. I've lived some of that myself. It's a pain in the ass, but it's better than being a wage slave. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Robinson. Uh, thank, thank you for the uh, interesting lecture. lecture. I was, I was wondering, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, philosophy of Robert Heinlein as, uh, as it relates to the 21st century, and uh, like uh, thinking particularly of books like Starship Troopers and uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. I was wondering what you think of his philosophy in the context of the 21st century. Well, um, Heinlein was many things through the course of his career. As a young person, he was a utopian thinker and a kind of a, uh, they called him Crazy Bob in the Los Angeles Science Fiction Society when they were all young together. This is Bradbury and Heinlein and L. Ron Hubbard and a few others that you would recognize the names of. But as he got older, I, he got more libertarian and more of a right winger. And in, in Starship Trooper, he suggests that the country would run better if it were run by a junta, a military government and that only people could vote who had been in the military. In The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, he suggests that a kind of a libertarian anarchist state would be able to uh, be in a direct democracy and, and throw rocks down at the uh, earth to make earth allow them to be what they want to be. I'm not sympathetic to Heinlein. And I also make a, a big dichotomy. I, I have a Manichaean element in me that likes to see things in big duologies, you know, either good or bad. Government's good, capitalism's bad. It, it goes on like that. Dodgers are good, the giants are bad. <laughs> I'm serious about that one. Um, so in this case, I think Heinlein's bad and Asimov is good. Asimov, a New York Jewish immigrant uh, polymath really smart, really good at predicting real futures, a, a chemist and a pretty entertaining writer, hilarious guy. Um, he wasn't perfect, but he was um, uh, someone with a strong liberal bent to his politics. And he's the one that when uh, Heinlein and a few other writers went to Reagan and said, you could build Star Wars 
and, and then we would conquer the world, and, and Asimov was one of them, along with Arthur C. Clarke, who's another great thinker, who went to the administration and said, you know, that actually doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And Well, it was a fantasy project. Uh, and so science fiction is riven by, it has the politics from the far right to the far left. And that's a sign of the health of the genre and the community that I'm in. Because very often on a panel, you'll be you'll watch two writers go hammer and tongs, just hammer and tongs. Norman Spinrad, Jerry Purnell, hard leftist, hard rightist. And then an hour later, they'll be in the bar talking about their families and having a drink together. This was the way the science fiction community worked for the longest time, and I'm very proud of it as such. And so I think it's a sign of the health there. But I'm definitely not a, not a hind leaning. Yes? Dr. Robertson, lovely, lovely lecture. Thank you very much. I have actually two questions. One is a very simple literary question. I have to admit that the only thing, I've got several of your books on my shelf at home, but I, the one that I've only that I've read is A Year of Rice and Salt, which I absolutely adore. Well, thank you. Uh, out of curiosity, was there any influence of uh, Yuki Mishima in, on that, if by chance? You can see if, see if uh, his final, t uh, see if fertility. There's a right. similar. Well, I, I, I read a little Mishima in the 70s, but I don't know that the years of rice and salt came from somewhere else. And so I can't really speak very well about um, um, sources for that one. Yeah. I have one other additional question, which is a little bit more uh, philosophical. We're clearly living in an era of paradigm shifts. Um, I think I grew up, I'm 38. So, so I grew, I grew up, up before, before uh, I'm, I'm not a digital, digital native. native, I'm a video game native, but not a digital native. native. Um, so, so there's that shift, shift obviously, from print technology to electronic technology. technology. Um, do, do you think, think that we're, we're witnessing in economics the same type of, of paradigm shift that neoclassical neo economics, with its uh, emphasis on rationality, with the emphasis on equilibrium modeling, has come to be revealed by 2008 to be if not completely bankrupt, problematic. Um, do you think that we're living through a paradigm shift in economics at this point? Um, that's a good question because I, I do think 2008 was a, a shock to this generation, which means all of us. The one people alive now, 2008 was a kind of a mini um, uh, Great Depression, 1930 or 1929. And um, an economist explained to me that in 1929, about 25% uh, of the people lost their jobs. And in, and in 2008, it was about 10% of the uh, people lost their jobs. And so after, after two, 1929, you get the Glass-Steagall Act. And after 2008, you get the um, Dodds-Frank Act. And so, but he was being very limited, poli-sci, economist, precise. Uh, and people need to be that way. But in the larger uh, way that you're talking about, I think we're in that zone. There was a talk today at the conference I was at that reinvoked uh, Thomas Kuhn's structures of scientific revolutions. You have pre-normal science when you don't know what's going on. Finally, you get a paradigm that explains everything. You have normal science for a while. Anomalies begin to pile up. And then there's a break and a revolutionary paradigm shift to a new uh, paradigm that will explain even the anomalies. Well, you could say 2008 was one of the anomalies uh, that we can't, that ordinary capitalism will say, well, boom, bust, boom, bust, it's all good because the booms are always bigger than the busts. But one of the things about Jason Moore's book, Capitalism in, in the Web of Life, is that there's not the phys physical basis for another boom because you can't get more for cheaps. You can't get more cheap resources, people, labor, and energy. Everything's got more expensive, so that the way that capitalism has always moved on to its next um, boom period is no longer available to us. So we may be in the, a period of paradigm breakdown in economics. We may be headed towards post-capitalism. But when you have to invoke a small town in Spain with uh, 100,000 people as your only functioning model, for a post-capitalist state that actually works as a, as a successor and within building the new society within the shell of the old, the old IWW phrase. If you, that's the way you want to do it. You don't want to have a, a, a mass extinction event. You don't want to have a world revolution. It's too violent. It's too much damage. It's too much um, uh, blowback. 
what you want is an orderly succession to a better system, a new paradigm coming along. And so I, I don't think, I think we're trembling on the brink. I think we're all confused that we're in a state of maximum confusion right now. Well, maybe not maximum confusion. It could probably get more confusing even tomorrow. <laughs> it's an unprecedented situation. Yes? I am a climate change activist who's trying to decide if my time is best spent advocating for a price on CO2 or trying to address the corrupting influence of money on democracy. Thoughts? Well, I know everybody's only got a certain amount of hours. Um, but the, I will say that these are two parts of the same problem. And so uh, you need to maybe split your time 50-50. The climate change problem is a matter of mispricing in the current economic system, which is held in place by, we elect people to go to Congress and make laws, but then the people that paid for them care campaigns actually um, uh, convince them that the laws to be written will benefit them rather than us. This is the crisis of representation. Our representatives aren't representing us. So that is part of the problem. And so the two are so connected. If, if you would just say that these are two parts of the same problem and, and go on from there, I think it would, it would clarify a lot. Yes, Fred. Um, thank you, as brilliant as usual, Dan. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is something that I've just started to think about. And it's another huge change that is going on and that I don't see people really dealing with in science fiction, particularly because, as you say, of the dystopian kind of preference, you might say. And that is that what's happened, I guess, in my lifetime since World War II, the biggest thing that has happened in some ways, uh, I guess other than climate change, has been the uh, transfer of uh, I suppose uh, two or three of uh, two or three billion people from wretched, desperate poverty to what you might call more or less the lower middle class, and in an enormous increase in in life expectancy all over the planet. It's not just uh, China and India, but it's uh, you know, Latin America. It's now Africa. I mean, the, 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 you know, the rate of, of uh, uh, increase in living standards in Africa, with all of the you know, uh, military and political turmoil, has been extraordinary. So something is going on here. It's going on you know, either partly because of or partly in spite of the economic system uh, as you describe it. But, um, you know, what if we extrapolate that? What if, you know, the world is changing under our feet. We're, I think sometimes we think, you know, in, in, in the US and in, uh, in Europe, we think in terms of changes that have been happening in the US, US and Europe, but the changes that are happening in Brazil, in, uh, in Nigeria and, uh, and Indonesia and you know, China, uh, even J Japan was a poor country, <laughs> Korea. Um, what's going on and how do we deal with that in science fiction terms? Well, there's a, there's a story that's being con uh, cobbled together by um, a group of writers and thinkers whom I'm reading, and so is everybody else who reads the London Review of Books and the New Left Review and, and other venues like that, it says that after World War II, well, this is a great story for science fiction, that when they had to reconstitute the world after World War II at Bretton Woods and in the UN meetings, um, they, the, the people were mostly men, a lot of them were British and Americans, and they, when they thought, how could the world run better and we not get into this horrible war situation again? And that, well, we need things to be a scientific meritocracy at the top, a technocracy running things, who people, experts who know what they're doing. And we need a social safety net so that everybody on the planet is not gonna fall into horrible poverty and then join some violent group. 
And those are both H.G. Wells' utopian ideas that come out of the earlier socialist tradition of the 19 of the 1800s. So, uh, in other words, there were ideas that were out there floating about as to how to run the world a little better for everybody. And after World War II, there was the possibility of instituting them all at once. And we rebuilt uh, Japan and, and uh, Europe on the Marshall Plan and in the Japanese plans on the, uh, the surpluses that the winning side of the war had. But the social structure of the post-war period caused a 30-year, what they call the, the, the Miracle 30 in France, 30 years of prosperity for everybody on the planet, From even though there was a Cold War. Like you say, public health um, and the application of the sciences and a social safety net and education was making a better world everywhere. But in 1980, Thatcher and Reagan said, well, that's all bad. That was government. And government's the problem, not the solution. And there is no other alternative, and there is no such thing as society. And the neoliberal counter-revolution study in 1980 has built the world that we're in now, where the project is not keeping the whole planet's population doing well. The project is, is quarterly profit and shareholder value. And that's supposed to equate to um, goodness for all. It doesn't. And there are indeed a couple billion people out of the seven billion people going to bed tonight with what they call food insecurity. And that, there was a millennial plan in 2000. The UN said, well, let's get rid of that. Let's make sure that we get people out of poverty from the very bottom. Enormous strides have been made in the last 17 years on that project. It was not a for-profit project. It was done on the margin. It was done with the surplus of capitalism. Governments gave money to the UN who paid people to go out into the field and do the public health and do the development work that drew uh, about a billion people out of immiseration into the lower middle class. What it shows is that could be done if that was the civilizational project. The millennial goals of 2000 being achieved so fast, it shows that if that was the civilization's project, we could do it for everybody, get everybody to a kind of floor of adequacy and then go on from there in an optopia, where things were as good as they could get. And considering what had happened between 1932 and 1945, it's amazing what humans did between 1945 and 1989. Um, an achievement in cooperation that even included a lot of um, American-Soviet cooperation, even though there was supposedly this Cold War going on, which there was. Um, so yeah, I, I am not a dystopian. I am a utopian writer. And then you have to look at these good things that you mentioned and say, that can happen. But it can't happen in the uh, global financialization of value, where, where we're not paying attention to paying the true costs for the environment and for people's labor. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Yep. Uh, I am a sophomore engineering major at Texas a and while being an engineering major, you get to hear about a lot of different technology advancements and everything. So uh, last year, Elon Musk presented his plan to send humans and have footprints on Mars by mid-2020s. He also put together all the different technologies and all that. Um, we've been talking about economics, governance, and culture and society as a whole, uh, dealing with the problems of the 21st century. As a science fiction writer, what is your view on these problems in the 21st century with two worlds, where we have two cultures almost completely self-sustaining on two completely different planets uh, interacting with each other? Well, that's, that's called the Mars Trilogy. The answer is, um, the answer is about 2,000 pages long. Um, uh, let me unpack that a little and say that um, I think uh, Elon Musk is doing great work with um, electric cars, with solar panels and solar roof tiles now, and with rocketry. The, the Falcon Heavy is a great rocket. Um, uh, we'll finally have a heavy booster like the Energia and like the old Saturns. And, and the, indeed, that first stage lands and is reused. Um, it's visionary stuff, and it is a lot of young engineers. I, I hear that a lot of the people working at SpaceX are right out of Georgia Tech with their engineering degrees. And they, the people that I met there at SpaceX said they like to hire young, new engineers because they're not set in their ways as to what's possible and what's not possible. But the Mars project is, is um, disjunct in time from our current emergency. 
Is, and what I mean by that is we need to fix things on Earth in the next 100 to 200 years or else we might have tipped over into an unprecedented disaster. Um, and the Mars project, getting there and setting up an Antarctica base, we could do that in 10 years. Occupying it as a civilization is probably more like a 1,000 to a 5,000 year project. Terraforming it might be a 50,000 year project. So you see the discrepancy I'm talking about. So Mars is not a planet B. Mars isn't another, and going to be another world for thousands of years, and it'll only work if we've already solved our problems here quite nicely. I do think we should go there and set up like a McMurdo, an Antarctic base where scientists go with astronauts. They spend one cycle there, they study, they come back home because otherwise your health is wrecked. So it's just like Antarctica. You go there, you study, you come back. It's fascinating, it's beautiful. I've been to Antarctica twice and the scientists down there are having more fun than anybody. Um, and um, so I love the Mars project and I love Musk's projects. His Mars plan had a weird a bogus factor in the middle of it, a sales pitch for sending 100 rich people to a village that was already going to be there. No, it's not going to be that way. So that was a, also, he's, he's hand waving at a technical problem that you might know more about than me. Landing on Mars has so far been a 50 50 proposition. In other words, we have the 50% success rate, meaning a 50% failure rate, even for these little things we send up there. Once you put people in it, 50% is not really good enough. And so there are outstanding problems in the Mars landing and the project that we have to, I didn't even know about these things. Some of these things nobody knew about when I wrote the Mars books. So um, I have, I don't mean to have deceived the world about the possibilities for Mars. I think they're still there. It's just that I crushed the timeline in an unrealistic way. And it's just like I was telling you, one lens of my Mars novel is just talking about us right now. The other one is talking about what Mars could become, but way out there. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to I'm going to have to put it into the Q and A, um, but uh, don't despair because uh, Stan Robinson's going to do a book signing in the lobby. Um, also, and some of his books are going to be uh, on sale. Also, uh, our other keynote speakers for the conference, Ari Heinrich and uh, Alice Drager, are here. And uh, they're willing to sign books as well, which will also be on sale. So you can, uh, you can also meet them. Um, please join me in thanking Stan for his lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Yeah, thank you very much.